Always a blessing to worship with you all. Always hard to stop the fellowship. But don't worry, there's time after. <laughs> oh my goodness. I was joking with Heath and Jill up here. I said, if, if, you, if you hate people, then today's passage is for you. Because uh, it's going to challenge some of those social things. But anyway, uh, good morning. Got to kick it off with a good morning. Yeah, uh, things around here have been kind of topsy-turvy lately. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the construction, although if you go and try to peek in to see through some Venetian blinds or something, some of the construction happening, uh, it, is, it is very inside out, right? Uh, like the floor is on top of the, the dirt is on top of the floor today, uh, you know, as construction will do, flipping things topsy-turvy. But really, I'm talking about our sermon series uh, entitled Upside Down, Stories That Change the World. And uh, <clears throat> this series, by the way, I was thinking about that in worship this morning, actually, do you know that every time we come to church, we're flipping something upside down, right? Or God is flipping it upside down and we're just focused on it, yeah? Because even in the, the lyrics to the songs, we saw some of that. We are the freedom generation, right? How many people outside the church would say, oh, those churchgoers, they're all bound to churchiness and law. And like, really, it's the opposite. There's a freedom here that you can only experience in Christ. We proclaim that things are upside down all the time. And it's fun to have a series, like parable series, that makes that proclamation explicit. Well, along those lines, I've been thinking this week uh, about a guy that I knew briefly in my life who really turned my expectations upside down one particular day. And I want to tell you about him. I uh, studied in seminary up at Regent College in Vancouver, B.C. And in my final year there, uh, I lived right on one of the West Side's busiest streets called Broadway. And I really lived right on Broadway. In fact, that was probably as close as I will ever get. To Broadway. It's sad, but true. Um, but all I had to do was walk out my front door and boom, I was on Broadway. And then a couple blocks away, big bus stop that I would take the bus to campus most, most days. Well, it was in front of a Safeway and it was a busy bus stop. And there was a guy there named Lon and uh, he was there most of the time. Now, Lon was one of a few long-term homeless folks who lived in that area. And he made a good portion of his living at that bus stop. And he would sit with a Starbucks cup uh, that was torn around the edges, always, by the way. I think he did it for effect, but uh, it's kind of torn around the edges. And he wouldn't say much, and he would sit there. But he was a little bit intimidating to be around uh, at first because he had been on the streets for a long time. I asked him one time, and he told me he'd been on the streets for 12 years. Uh, and he looked like he'd been on the streets for 12 years. He was missing several teeth, long, gray, unkempt hair, and just a little bit like, whoop, you know, like when you first see that person, you, you think a little bit, right? Well, eventually, Lon and I started to chit-chat a little bit, but there was nothing we could do to, uh, to deny that we lived on either side of a very clear social divide, right? Uh, I was a very privileged 28-year-old graduate student, and Lon was Lon, right? Well, one day... I uh, got to the bus stop, and I was in a particularly sour mood. And I don't remember why. That just goes to show you how unimportant those sour moods are. I don't remember why, but I was. I remember that. I grumbled all the way to the bus stop. I must have been grumbling to myself when I arrived. Uh, Lon was there, but he was doing something that I had not seen until then, which was he had a, a little box of old postcards, and he was trying to sell them for like a buck each, or a toonie if you're Canadian. Happy birthday, Canada, yesterday, by the way. Um, <laughs> so he, he's selling these postcards and I walked up grumbly and I said, hi, Lon. And he said, Hey man, and as we always did, but then he did something new again. He said, how you doing? I don't know if he could read my body language. And I didn't want to lie to him because like I knew Lon and I said, you know what, actually I'm doing bad. I'm having a bad day. Now I know that sounds audacious for me to say to somebody who's been on the streets for 12 years, but I was having a bad day. So I told him and he said this quote, well, one day at a time, man. One day at a time. And I was like, you know, normally I would dismiss that as trite sentiment, but from lawn, okay. And that was it. That was our conversation. Such was our friendship. You know, just, man, we understand each other, right? Well, the bus eventually came, <clears throat> and uh, people started crowding on. And just right in the worst moment, right as we were crowding onto the bus, Lon reaches out uh, one of his postcards out of his box, and he says, here, take this. And I said to him, no, 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 you keep that, sell that, that's cool, I'm good. And he goes, no, man. And he raised his eyebrows and he really held it out. And he said, take this. So I didn't know what to do, people were waiting for me. So I took it and I thanked him. 
And I got on the bus. And I never forgot about it for the rest of my life. That was 12 years ago. And that image you see on the screen is the actual postcard that Lon gave me that day. And I know it because I keep it right here in a frame in my office ever since for 12 years and counting. It sits on a shelf. So when you come visit me in my office, look for it. It's up on the shelf. And I keep it there to remind me that the love that I am able to give is really always the result of the love that I have already been given. That day, Lon reached out to me in a way that was much more meaningful than any way I had ever reached out to him. Sure, I'd given him some change. I even gave him some food from the Safeway when I was leaving because that's where I got my groceries. Hey, Lon, here's an apple, whatever. And he always thanked me. He was nice. Nothing compared to the gift that Lon gave me that day. I doubt Lon is talking about the apple I gave him 12 years later, right? And yet here we are, and I'll never forget him for that. So that turned my expectations upside down because Lon, someone I least expected, crossed the divide to me. And Jesus' parable today also turns our expectations upside down in a story that is so familiar, it's almost taken on a bit of a fairy tale type quality. And I'll explain that. What I mean by fairy tale is this. A fairy tale is a simple story that most of us learn as kids, the meaning of which we're pretty sure we get. Now, when I say the good Samaritan, some of you, I'm sure, get what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one about the guy who's nice to the other guy. That story. Well, it's taken on a bit of that quality, but we know that this story still brings quite a world-changing challenge, and I can prove it. How many people do we know, including ourselves, who are actually obeying its simple command to go and do likewise? We're going to explore that as we go through it. The passage today is in Luke chapter 10, if you have a Bible with you. Uh, If you don't, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. I'll refer to some stuff around it as well, so it's always good to have it open. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your uh, soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? You've answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, well, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as always, there is a lot going on in this passage, but I want to invite you to keep one overarching image in your minds throughout the next few minutes, okay? And that image is this, of a great divide. It'll look different for each of you, but just imagine a great divide, okay? Because there's at least three happening in this passage. There's the ethnic and cultural divide that existed between the Samaritans and the Judeans, which, by the way, is where you get the word Jewish and Jew. So Samaritans and Jew is just short for saying Samaritan and Judean, okay? 
So ethnic, cultural divide. There's also, though, the experiential divide between this present life in which we live and an eternal, ideal life to come, which we call eternal life. And there's one more. There is the spiritual divide between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. All three of those are actually present right here in this short passage. And all three of these divides, I'm going to use as a symbol, I think Jesus may have been too, the road itself. The road itself that the person was going down is a great symbol because the priest and the Levite crossed to the other side of that road while the Samaritan crossed the divide to the man in need. And like him, Jesus has crossed all three of these great divides. And because Jesus crossed the divide to us, we are enabled to cross the divide to others. We're going to look at all three of these divides, and I'm actually going to rank them in the order that I think we should be seeing them in terms of importance. Now, my rankings might be a little bit upside down, to use a phrase, but I think, uh, I think it's justified based on where we see it land in Luke and the other themes that I'm talking about. So in third place, our third place focus is the divide between people based on culture and ethnicity. Now, it is important. It was important to Jesus. There's a reason he chose a Samaritan in his story. And we know it's important to us. It's actually probably the one that the world today would put in the number one spot for what this story is really about. So I'm not saying it's not important. I just think it's the third most important of these three. Okay, And it's in third place in terms of the gospel. I'll explain why in a minute. But so that we fully wrap our minds around what the Samaritan-Judean feud was about. Let me give you a little bit of of history. (laughs) Cast your minds back, if you would, to the year 922 B.C. Okay? About almost a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth. The uh, kingdom uh, of Israel and the kingdom of Judah have split and there's been kind of a civil war, and there's a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. 200 years later, the Assyrians came in, and they conquered that northern kingdom. A lot happened, and one of the things that happened was a sort of theological and ethnic intermixing, a cultural assimilation, okay? That's about 722 and following. By about the 500s, and really most surely in the 400s B.C., This uh, had evolved into a sort of hatred between the people in the south who saw themselves as truly God's people and the people in the region of Samaria. And we know that it was that early because it's even right there in that Bible. In the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, both of them mention the, the bitterness between Samaritans and Judeans. People, this is 400 years before Jesus and the disciples were even on the scene. That is an old grudge, right? So this is the kind of animosity they feel for each other. Notice this in the uh, chapter right before this, Jesus heads through Samaria with the disciples down on his way to Jerusalem. He had to go south through Samaria. And as he went through, Luke tells us the Samaritans rejected him when they heard where he was going. Oh, you're going to Jerusalem? Scram. Right? So that's the animosity, right? But wait, there's more. The disciples' reaction is classic and really shows us how much hatred there was. They say this, Lord, um, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Jesus rebukes them, thankfully, because it's a little extreme when someone won't put you up in their house and you want to call down like heavenly napalm and, and kill them all. A little, little much. But that's where the disciples were at. That's how hot the hatred was between Samaritans and and the Judeans, okay? Moreover, Jesus paints a picture of this Judean priest and Levite that is almost comically exaggerated, okay? They see the victim on the road, right? And, And they go to the other side. Well, author Rob Bell observes this about that route, okay? The road to Jericho was really just a footpath. And what you're looking at is a photo of part of that trail that I found on a woman's travel blog. That's a friend of hers. And I love the photo because just like Rob Bell points out, it is barely a road. It's really a trail, at least this portion of it. And the whole thing, and I even Google mapped this thing, the whole thing is very hilly, very cavernous, very, very dangerous. And most scholars agree, no doubt, 
why it was a favorite for highway bandits and so forth, right? Because it was easy for them to attack and then get away and hide. So this is what the road to Jericho generally looks like. And Rob Bell says this. The road between the two cities is really just a trail a few feet wide. Jesus is being funny here, he suggests, because there was no other side with a wall of rock on one side and a drop off on the other. You almost get this ridiculous image of the priest or Levite walking by this victim and having to almost like do one of these along the, along the rocks like making a concerted effort to avoid this person who really is probably just a couple of feet away from them. I don't know about you, but when I heard about this story as a kid, I pictured a road, right, where I could really like, I'm just going to walk way. No, probably not, right? A little more uncomfortable than that. So the law expert knows this, and he would have easily justified this by saying, yeah, well, we've got ritual purity laws and so forth, so there. But you know what he didn't see coming? A Samaritan. He didn't, see a, a, he didn't see a Samaritan coming on the scene. That really flips this law expert's expectations upside down. And what he does, of course, sets a model for all of us when it comes to how we treat people, especially people from what we would call the other side of the particular divide. Now, before I close this particular topic, this social divide that we experience, I do want to explain why we should be cautious in reading the Good Samaritan story and stopping here. Here's why. If we do, if we see this only as a message of social justice, it can quickly lead us to a mere humanistic social justice type of gospel. Okay? Remember, Jesus cared. He chose a Samaritan on purpose. But he was saying much more than go and be kind. He was saying much more than go and be really kind. He was saying much more than that. He was saying something about eternity, something about eternal life. And we know he was because don't forget the question that prompts this entire conversation. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So that is our second place divide. The third place, social divide, the one we recognize the quickest. Second place, though, is a divide between the way we live now and some kind of eternity which we look forward to in some way. And that's what leads this this, uh, dialogue. Now, the teacher of the law says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The word eternal is troublesome. It's ambiguous, whether it means a heavenly afterlife or whether it means some kind of future messianic age or whatever. But that's actually not the main problem with his question. The problem with his question is with the word must. What must I do? Now, I don't know if we have any lawyers in the house. I don't want to be offensive to you, but correct me if I'm wrong. The whole nature of law is to define limits to define bottom lines, right? To talk to us about how far we can misbehave until we've misbehaved in an illegal way, right? And so, for example, what must I do to avoid a speeding ticket? Well, you you must not drive over the speed limit. You may drive at 10 and 2. You may check your mirrors every 5 to 10 seconds. You may be an A driver's ed student, But that's not how you avoid a speeding ticket. How you avoid a speeding ticket is you must not speed. It's the bottom line. And that's what the lawyer is looking for here, the law expert. What must I do? What's the bare minimum? When have I gone over that line? And he answers his own question, love your neighbor as yourself, love God. And he's right, but he's not finished. He wants to know the bottom, bottom line. The bottom of the bottom line. Okay, I love my neighbor. Who's that? Of course, Jesus flips his expectations upside down by even suggesting that that might be a Samaritan. That would have surprised him, and I'm sure it just surprised his disciples. I would have been, loved to have been a fly on the wall in that moment with them. But that's not really even what is turning this upside down. Here's what it is. He's looking for a bottom line. He's looking for a minimum. And Jesus says, how about this? How about I tell you the maximum? How about that instead? See, what this law expert is looking for is what's the bare minimum? And Jesus' answer is minimum. There is no minimum. 
What do you mean, how much is enough? Can you imagine having the audacity to ask Jesus, hey, so uh, how many people do I need to love till I've loved enough? That's what he's asking, though. And Jesus' answer is enough. I don't, I'm not here to talk about enough. There is no enough. No, 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 no. You are asking the wrong question. You're focused on the wrong thing. Because if there was enough, oh man, we'd be in trouble. Consider. Okay, if Jesus had said, you know who you should love instead? You should love Samaritans. The guy would have been like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Okay, how many Samaritans? He's just going to keep asking for that bare minimum. He's just going to keep asking for that limit. Ten? Is ten Samaritans enough? How about a hundred? I have loved a hundred of my enemies. Yay me. Is that enough? Maybe, maybe not. How about a thousand? Have you, have you ever loved a thousand people you can't stand? You'd be a pretty amazing person. Is that enough? It's a ridiculous question. And nowhere in the gospel does it even suggest that we should be asking such a question. And that's why Jesus doesn't answer it. He gives them a completely different way to think about it. Eternal life is not about doing the bare minimum. Eternal life is about something very different. Eternal life is something that Jesus himself crossed the divide to achieve. And that is our first and most important focus in terms of the, the divides in this story is the divide between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. Now, if you know much about parables, you won't be that surprised. About 20% of all of the parables in the Gospels make explicit reference to the kingdom of God. And a lot of the other ones make implicit allusions to it, just like this one does. Now, again, if you have a Bible, a little bit of just quick text stuff, check out chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus has sent the 72 out, right? But he sent them out to do a couple things. To heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to tell people a very specific message. That the kingdom of God has come near. Any coincidence now that this parable of the Good Samaritan shows up right after that? No, I don't think so. And wait, it's not done yet. Luke, being the good writer he is, remembers that Jesus, just after this, chapter 11, verse 2, the disciples say, teach us how to pray. And he says, okay, Father, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. The Good Samaritan story is flanked on both sides by explicit teachings that the kingdom of God has come and that our whole purpose as followers of Jesus is to be leaning into and praying for the kingdom of God to continue to come. It is that kingdom of God that sets this entire thing in context. Compassion matters, but I'm going to go out on a limb here, guys. Compassion matters, but it does not turn the world upside down. It doesn't. And I, and, and I know it doesn't because everybody gets it. Nobody is debating it. Nobody is saying, no, compassion, bad. We get it. I just came from a, a, a context uh, where I learned that everyone, for various reasons, thinks it's good to be nice, kind, compassionate, and so forth. So that doesn't turn the world upside down. It's something everybody understands. Moreover, now, the call to love our enemies, now that is revolutionary, right? That definitely flips the paradigm upside down. But even that is not causal, meaning that even doesn't cause the kingdom of God to come. So the Christian journey is not a journey of, if I just am compassionate enough, the kingdom of God will come. And it's even not, to, we can't even say that it's, if I just muster up the willpower to love someone I'm at odds with, well, by golly, then the kingdom of God will come then. No, it's the exact opposite of that. The Christian journey is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and God's holy word came to close the gap between this world and God's kingdom. And it is because of that that now I can start to express a compassion that matters, a compassion that lasts, a compassion that leads to eternal life. And do you know where God's kingdom came first? came to you and it came to me we respond to the love of jesus with our acts of compassion with the love of the stranger or the people that god puts in front of us we respond we don't bring it we don't earn it 
And that's the biggest upside down paradigm shift of this parable. He came for us. He was cro- he crossed the divide to us. He was given for us. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. This meal is the expression of Jesus crossing the divide so the kingdom of God would come So the gap between this life and the next would be closed. So that the schisms that tear human relationships apart would begin to be healed. And so that having received him, we would be enabled to follow his example and to cross the divide just like he did to go and do likewise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and living God, This is a high, high calling you've given us. But it's one that we know we are not alone in fulfilling. Quite the contrary, Father, you have already crossed the divide to us, reached out in our own time of greatest need, showed us the example of what it truly looks like to lay down our life, not only for our friends, not only for our neighbors, but for whomever we may find along the path. Thank you for this word. Thank you for turning us around. Thank you for giving us your spirit to enable us to move ahead, following you and becoming more and more like you every day. Pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.